Thank you very much. Just a checking, everyone can hear me all the way in the back. Sweet. Thank you, everyone. I am Ayesha. I will be talking to you all about building accessible components, specifically how this lets you scale accessibility throughout your product and throughout your organization without needing everyone to be an accessibility expert. Does anyone here work at a company where everyone is an accessibility expert? <laughs> yeah, thought so. So I hope this will be useful for all of us. <laughs> uh, a real quick little fun fact. My parents actually met here in Boston after immigrating from Germany and India. And so I always really love being back here. Uh, it's kind of a special place for me. And so fun shot of my very stylish parents from 89. <laughs> A little bit about me, I work as the UX engineer at Optimizely, which is an experimentation software. Some of you may be familiar. Before that, I was working on the Lightning Design System at Salesforce. Most importantly, I am the dog mom to a nine-year-old mini schnauzer named Pepper. And there is a picture at the end if you stick it out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also a proud musical theater geek. Uh, I was joking with some of the other speakers that this is how I get myself on stage now without doing the musical theater part try to give talks. <laughs> so what does being a UX engineer at Optimizely mean? My job generally entails four different key areas. Component libraries, building out the actual fundamental components that the rest of our organization uses. Our library is called OUI, as a nickname for Optimizely UI. I also work on the design system around this component library, helping out with all the documentation and all the different pieces that Emma mentioned earlier. I then use a lot of these components to prototype. Sometimes I prototype to help for customer research and customer sessions. Sometimes I, that prototyping ends up just being kind of a quick proof of concept before the rest of the engineering team takes it on and builds it into the product. And every now and then, I get my hands dirty in the actual production code and make updates to our front end. Now, the underlying piece to all this work, as you might have suspected, is the component library. Those components are the core to all of my work. They're also core to a lot of the engineers' work. And so the other key part throughout all of this is accessibility. With it, no matter what I'm doing throughout all of these different areas, even prototyping, I try to ensure that everything I produce is accessible, especially because prototypes are often copy-pasted into the production code one of the benefits of prototyping with your own components, right? It's not throwaway code anymore. If you don't make that beginning prototype accessible, you risk the engineers not continuing that accessibility. So given that my world revolves around components and accessibility, we're going to look at some components, big surprise, and what kind of accessibility win we can get by ensuring that that particular component is accessible from the start. So we'll look at button icons and how this can improve the visuals. We'll look at inputs and what this means for screen reader users. And lastly, select dropdowns and how this can be very effective when done right for keyboard navigation, those who use the keyboard to navigate and use your product. So before I dive in too much, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. What is accessibility? It's essentially ensuring that everyone, no matter their ability, this is the key part, can perceive, understand, navigate, contribute to, interact with an application. So essentially anything one person can do, every other person can do on that application, website, product, whatever it might be, no matter their ability. Similarly, Let's just go over the benefits of a component library. We've heard about this a lot already today. The wonderful part about having a library is that every change made to a component permeates throughout your entire ecosystem. So if you make a change, it trickles down, everyone else gets the win for free. That also means that every change made to a component will permeate throughout the entire ecosystem. So, with great power that we all have by building components comes great responsibility. But I'm an optimist. It also comes with an endless opportunity to make the web a more accessible place. We have a lot of power by building out a component library that is used by the rest of the organization. 
And so if we can start at the component level, making that accessible, we get to propagate that accessibility throughout our application. So a really exciting place to be and ensure is that we as a company can hire people with disabilities, our customers using our product can hire people with disabilities because the product itself is accessible. So with that, let's take a look at our first accessibility win, the visual side of things. Is it legible? Is the interface understandable for all users? Especially people who have maybe low vision, colorblind, right? This affects a lot more people than you might expect. So we wanna make sure we're doing this properly. When we talk about button icons, there are kind of three problem areas that we can easily address at the component level. The focus and hover states, the contrast, and titles on the buttons. So who's familiar with this beautiful blue outline? Everyone kind of know what that is? Yeah, this is like a browser defaults focus ring around a focusable element. Now, who's familiar with this little line of code? <laughs> I'm guilty of doing this. I know plenty of people here are also guilty of doing this. Uh, when you add outline none as one of your button resets, you are taking away some default accessibility that browsers have built in. So we can take this away, but we need to add something back. Uh, you might be wondering why I've posted the same button icon four times. The fun fact is that this is not the same button icon. This is actually four different states of, our, of how our button icon started. Uh, the neutral state, the hover state, focus, and the focus and hover state. Now, if you can spot a difference in these, props to you because I cannot and I had trouble keeping the screenshots apart when I was making this slide. But with a little easy fix, we're adding back that you know, indicator that we removed with our outline none CSS. We add a box shadow on the focus state. We start to get to a place where the different states are actually differentiated, right? I've also here changed the colors used for the neutral state and the hover state and separated those a little bit more. So I made neutral state light enough that still passes contrast. Hover state is darker. The focus states get the box shadow. So now we can start to have clearly defined states. They actually look like four different buttons. The other part of button icons that we really wanted to address was contrast. Initially, all of our button icons had a default fill for the SVG contained within them. It was just our brand purple dark color token that came from our design system. But we wanted to add some flexibility to this component and allow our users to change the color of the button. Now, as a first approach, and this is an approach many of us might take as a first approach, we created an icon fill property that was a string type, lets people pass in a hex value to determine what the fill of that SVG is. All fine and dandy, we've created lots of flexibility and customization options for our users, but, this also means they could put in any color, right? My default to go to is ABC, ABC, because I like to remember that. But when you actually test that out against the white background that this button icon would be sitting against, the contrast ratio is very, very low. It's only 1.76, which is not enough to pass double or triple A accessibility standards. So this puts a lot of pressure on our users now all of a sudden, right? Like, they have to go make sure that whatever color they specified for icon fill has enough contrast against a white background. And it's not something we can guarantee every engineer is going to do when they add this property. So how can we make it better and easier for the user? Here, we have created a map uh, derived from our token palette. And these are the colors that we, as the component library maintainers, know are accessible against our app's white background. And we've also given them friendly names. So instead of having to remember green base, orange base, we just say green, orange. Now where does this get used? Prop types. Prop types are the most wonderful thing for creating accessible components. Because now I can say, okay, this fill can only be one of these nine values. It still gives customization opportunities to our users. They can have a green or a purple or an orange. 
But now we know that that color will still remain accessible and have enough contrast against our white background. Plus, we get the added benefit of it having, to having it be one of our brand colors, right? Instead of having wild colors all over our application, we've also now controlled everything to be within our brand palette that we've defined. So, lastly, titles. Titles, a lot of us, I as a keyboard user, as a mouse user, will hover over you know, all the button icons in VS Code to figure out what they all do. These can be very helpful for a variety of different users. The titles are also used for screen readers to let screen reader users know what this particular button does. Now, the underlying code behind our button icon expects a title prop to be passed in and we'll add it as the title attribute on the button if it was passed in. But with the help of prop types and the is required bit, we can ensure that every button icon is going to have a title. This is another tiny one-liner, not even one-liner, like, I don't know, 12, 15 characters that suddenly makes all of our button icons a little more accessible because we can guarantee they will have a title. Can't guarantee the quality of the title. We still need our engineers to think and know that this should, you know, indicate what this button is going to do. But at least we can ensure they all have a title. So, let's move on to screen readers. What can we do to ensure that users who can't see the screen can still easily interact with everything on it? So here's a little snapshot from our storybook for OUI. Uh, this highlights all of the different components that we export, two of which are input and label. Now, some of you might be thinking, this is kind of a weird thing to see. Is it odd to be exporting both input and label? Turns out it is. <laughs> it's a bad idea. Uh, label here is starting to be misused. As an engineer, as a developer, you might come to something and think, oh yeah, this bit of text labels this portion or whatnot, right? That's a natural kind of conclusion from looking at a designer's sketch. However, using this label by itself, there's no input. Right, so suddenly we're using label for its style, not for its semantics, which is a really, really big accessibility no-no, right? The same way we don't wanna make a div a button, we wanna use a button for a button. We want to use a label when it's needed for an input, not just to put random text on the screen. There are utility CSS classes that we can use for that instead. Or maybe this should be one of the headings, right? Label's probably not the best element to be using for a simple line of text. Similarly, our input component to start with was very bare bones. The only required property that you needed for an input was the type property. So this was a totally valid component. What that means when you open up a screen reader and try to read this input, it'll just read edit text blank. Because again, this was using the input without the label component that we also exported. And it had no way of knowing what this input was called, what this input's purpose was. Within the component code, we had a little if block, it looked like this. If the user happened to be, you know, super overachiever and passed in the label prop, then let's add our label component and we'll be all fine and dandy. This is a lot of pressure on our users, right? They have to remember to add this label property, which probably isn't fair to require all our developers to know about this little connection that needs to be made between labels and their inputs. This relies on users knowing, reading documentation, which they might not have done. Instead, we can make some tiny little changes. We can require that the input component is used with an ID property and a label property. And now, instead of wondering if we've been passed a label property, we know we have. We've made it a required property. And this way, we can use the ID that's also been passed to properly connect our label and our input and no longer leave this option up to the users to remember to do. It's another example of how we can make it easier for people. And the key part of this, 
removing label from our exports, right? Let's remove that opportunity for developers to make this mistake and just not give it to them in the first place. We know that the input is going to include a label now because we've made it a required part of the component. No one should ever have a need for using the label component by itself anymore. Last one, let's look at keyboard navigation. Keyboard navigation means anything that you can do with a mouse, I can do with a keyboard, vice versa, right? Does anyone here ever use keyboard shortcuts? <laughs> yeah, pretty much all of us, right? All those shortcuts, anytime you tab through a form, you hit enter to submit it, right? That's all assist assistive technology that we are taking advantage of, right? It benefits many, many more people than just those that maybe can't use a mouse. So when we look at something like drop downs, also select drop downs, menus, people have very different names for this component, but it's essentially something that when clicked or activated with a keyboard opens up a drop down underneath, right? There are a few markup changes that we need to make to ensure that this can be accessible. So the activator to our drop down will have aria has pop up equals true. It'll also have an aria expanded attribute that changes between true or false depending on if the drop down is showing or not. <coughs> the menu itself is going to have role equals menu. And the menu items will either have a role of menu item or placeholder. Placeholder can be used when you have maybe like a heading or some kind of informational thing in the menu that is not an actually active element that you can select, right? Now, there is a native select element that uses options in HTML, right? That is generally used for choosing between a list of things. In Optimizely specifically, we use this kind of drop down for a lot of navigation type use cases. And so this is when, you know, for a typical workflow in Optimizely, you might go through five of these. So if I can make this one component accessible, I've gotten a huge win on the accessibility front for that user flow. However, drop downs are a little bit more work than those button icons and inputs we looked at. We have to do some extra JavaScript around ensuring that all the different key commands are working properly. So to trigger one of these drop downs, I might hit enter on the actual button. And then I can actually use my up and down arrow keys to cycle through all the different options of menu items. If there is submenus, I can use my right arrow key to dig into a submenu, then keep doing up and down. I can use my left arrow key to close that submenu. I'm starting to see what I'm getting at. There's a lot of different interactions we need to cover for that we don't get for free when we're doing this kind of drop down that doesn't take advantage of the native select drop down. So this is simply pseudocode. It's not complete by any means, but I just wanted to give you all a sense of what this type of work might look like. There are times when components need some extra love in order to make them accessible. In this case, it might mean keeping track of your current focused index and your state, watching for different key downs, and making sure that you know for a certain key, what is my interaction. Now. I know that is a lot. I could go on for hours on components. I could cover all 50 something that are in OUI if I really had the time. This would be a whole conference by itself. So let me take a chance to review a little bit about what we've learned. Takeaway number one. Why did I choose button icons, inputs, and select drop downs? Right? We have, I think I counted yesterday as about 54 components in OUI. That's a lot of components. And when I joined the company in February, uh, none of these were yet accessible, fully accessible. So how do I take a list like that and determine where to start? It's a really daunting task when looking at that huge list. I recommend start with your most used components. Button icons, inputs, and select dropdowns appear all over the place in Optimizely. They are very crucial to some of the core workflows like creating your first experiment, and so that's where I really wanted to start it. And these are also components that other developers can use as kind of a learning opportunity, right? They're easy to grasp your head around. They're not insanely complicated. Carousels have all kinds of crazy interactions. 
that's probably not a great place to start, especially when you're trying to teach other developers in your organization about accessibility. Number two, make it easier to do the right thing. So when we looked at button icons, we did few fixes, right? We limited what colors we could use for the SVG fill, and we made the title required. And by doing this, we've suddenly gotten to a place where our button icon is a lot more accessible. And it's, the pressure is not on our users to make sure that they pick the right color or remember to add the title, right? This is taken care of for them. Number three, some things shouldn't be flexible, like inputs. You don't want to give people the flexibility of using label by itself or the input or give them, give them the added requirement to remember to always use the label next to the input, right? These are things we can easily bake in from the component side so that our users don't have to worry about this. And lastly, good things take time and effort. It's really just a life lesson, not really particular to this talk. <laughs> But when you look at all these different components, like I said, we have you know, 54 that need to become accessible. And I recommend plotting them between effort and impact, right? How much effort does it take to improve this component? What is the impact? Sometimes you'll have easy ones like button icons. Very low effort, it was like two lines of code and a little bit of CSS to add back the focus state. And those button icons are used everywhere in our application. So we've already made a huge improvement. Sometimes it's more like select dropdowns, right? There's a huge impact because right now you can't complete any flow in Optimizely without, with just your keyboard. You have to rely on your mouse. But as we saw, there's a lot of behind the scenes effort that has to go into that one component. However, with the benefit of component libraries, we do it once for select dropdown and OUI. Everyone else gets the change for free. So that's in my book, that's a really high impact still on multiple fronts, even though it might take me or one of my fellow OUI developers a little bit more effort. So let me leave you with a few resources. Uh, Marcy Sutton recently gave a talk at Clarity that made me aware of this awesome service called Fable and AccessWorks. And these let you do usability testing with people who have disabilities. And so it's a fantastic way to test out your work test out your product or just the components themselves and ensure that they are doing everything that a user who is needing that assistive technology would need that component to do. The A11Y project is a site that you can go to now. It's amazing. It has a huge repertoire of all the different areas. I covered three like very high level areas. They go into full detail and give you all kinds of criterion for being AA and AAA accessible. And my biggest plea is to use other design systems and component libraries, right? Don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. There are tons out there who are open sourced, which is the beauty of being an open source community, right? If you wanna build a date picker, my advice is don't build a date picker. <laughs> it is a scary place, and Airbnb's React Dates has a wonderfully accessible one. So import that, do some style tweaks to make it match your brand, but don't start from scratch. If you want to chat more, come say hi to me during the breaks. Reach out on Twitter, Aisha K. Maz, or LinkedIn. And if you want to come help me build accessible products at Optimizely, you can always check out our job openings page. And with that, the promised pepper picture. Thank you very much.